Welcome back. We are going to pick up where we left off uh, the last time we met, which was discussing this idea of Russia between East and West. The situation that arises in the early modern period when Russia, having begin, begun to shift its attention, the state begun to shift its attention away from the East and the Tatar menace, which has been subjugated, toward the more dynamic, more technologically advanced, and more economically viable Western states of Polish, the Pol Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, Sweden, the German-speaking lands. There is an increasing competition that is emerging between the Russians and the Western Europeans. It's, it's obvious that during the reign, for example, of Ivan the, the, the Terrible, Ivan IV, uh, during his Livonian campaign, where he's attempting to try and utilize this amalgam of an army, some of the ancient army, the cavalry and the archers that have been used on the, uh, on, on the steppe against the Tatars, now incorporating as well uh, uh, more Western style units like the Pishalniki, our artillerists, and the Strelci. What Russia is grappling with in the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th century is trying to come to terms with those two major revolutions that radically transformed over that period Western Europe. Those two revolutions are the Gunpowder Revolution and the printing revolution. I talked a little bit at the end of our last uh, class period about the Gutenberg press and the delayed arrival of printing in Russia. There is another challenge that the Russians are facing, specifically the Orthodox faith is facing, in those lands that are contested by the Russian state and the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. What the Russians are facing is the growing cultural and religious influence of the Roman Catholic Church the Roman Catholic Church, which, uh, utilizing uh, its shock troops, the Jesuits, is undertaking a process of attempting to proselytize and convert members of orthodoxy into the Roman faith. And the, the ground zero of this process, and I apologize, this map is in Polish, but it's a great map. I'll explain what we're seeing here real quickly. We're looking here, of course, um, at the western Russian lands. Here's Tver. Um, up in the uh, upper right hand corner, Moscow would be off to the side. These are the lands of what is effectively today Ukraine. Okay. The green represents the, the areas in which Russian Orthodox uh, religious uh, members dominated. The lighter color would be uh, Roman Catholic with some Calvinists here in purple and Lutherans up there in gray. This is however, a contested frontier. Like those frontiers along the steppe with the Tatars or the Cossacks, it's an amorphous boundary. It's an amorphous boundary. All the same, you have a predominant Russian Orthodox uh, peoples here in uh, the east on this map and Roman Catholics here uh, to the west. The Jesuits over the course of the late 16th century forward are working aggressively to proselytize uh, and to convert members of, of, of the Orthodox faith. And this, this, the situation goes so far uh, into uh, 1596 that the, the church, uh, under, under the, the Pope at the time, establishes something known as the Union of Brest. And what the Union of Brest does is in order to win over greater support among the Russian Orthodox in the Ukrainian lands, the Union of Brest grants to those Ukrainians, those Orthodox faithful who are willing to do so, it allows them to keep their old liturgical rites. They can, they can conduct the liturgy, they can conduct the faith in Old Church Slavonic, but they, they agree to recognize the theological supremacy of the papacy. So it's going to bring them into communion with the Roman Catholic Church under something that comes to be known, depending upon who you're speaking with, either as the Uniate Church, the Uniate Church, or uh, I think it's Eastern Rite Catholicism. This is the origin of it, Union of Brest in 1596. For the Russian state, this is a real challenge, in no small part because the Russian Orthodox Church is putting increasing pressure on the state to do something about this, because the church is losing members of its faith to the heretical devil Latins. Right? Uh, the, the level of xenophobia that exists um, uh, is, is growing a bit stronger. Most of uh, the, the Bielorussians and Ukrainians who reside within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth are going to be affected by the Union of Brest. A majority, a majority of the Ukrainian nobility 
and a majority of the Ukrainian church hierarchy is going to accept the Uniate faith. They're going to accept the Union of Brest, while most parish clergy and most ordinary everyday peasants and townspeople and traders are going to remain true to Russian Orthodoxy, and it begins to create a cultural divide within these lands, one that is going to last to a greater or lesser degree all the way to the present day. The Jesuits are going to embark upon another major offensive during the 1620s and the 1630s. They're going to try and impose Catholicism upon the Cossacks. The Cossacks, we talked about them last time as well, here along the southern lands, and the effort to try and impose Catholicism upon the Zaporozhian uh, uh, Cossacks and the Don Cossack host is going to lead to two major Cossack uprisings. The Cossacks want to retain their, uh, their Orthodox faith, and after the 1630s, the Cossacks are going to ally themselves politically with the Tsar in Russia as a way of preserving those uh, traditional ways and those traditional faiths. One of the interesting things is that uh, a churchman by the name of Peter Mogila, who was born the same year as the Union of Brest, 1596, um, is in the opening decades of the 17th century going to begin undertaking a series of major reforms that are designed to defend orthodoxy from the encroaching views of the Jesuits and the Latin church. He is himself ethnically a Moldavian, uh, but he becomes the principal defender of orthodoxy in what is uh, then and today Ukraine. He is arguably, not arguably, he is the most important orthodox ecclesiastical leader of the early 17th century. Um, his, his eventually he is going to rise to occupy the position of the Metropolitan of Kiev. Metropolitan of Kiev. This would be the equivalent, I think, in the, in the Roman Catholic Church of a bishop, okay? an individual who is in charge of a major urban center and the surrounding lands. In 1632, 1632, he is going to establish something known as the Kiev Theological Academy. It is the first institution for the Orthodox that is akin in, in its, in its full-blown way to something like a, a, a theological academy or a theological university in the West. He is going to write both a catechism and, a, and a, a confession for the Orthodox faithful. And it's under Mogila that a, a, an entire generation of clergy are going to be trained, out of whom are going to emerge the principal defenders of the Orthodox faith later in the 17th century. There are many ironies about Mogila not the least of which is that he himself had studied in Paris. He, he's a product of Western Jesuit education. Um, his school that he had trained at in Paris had necessarily, of course, been influenced by the Jesuits. And what Mogila is effectively going to do is he is going to adopt Catholic methods for fighting against the spread of Catholicism in Russian Orthodox lands. At his Kiev Theological Academy, most of the instruction, not all of it, but most of the instruction is actually going to take place in Latin. So now, belatedly, we see the arrival of what has already become the lingua franca uh, in early modern Europe, gradually seeping into the Russian lands, and ironically, it's coming as a result of the activities of an important churchman. It is through Mogila's efforts to educate, to enlighten, and to expand opportunities for Orthodox clergy that a group known as the Zealots of Piety, the Zealots of Piety, uh, come to form during the course of the middle of the 17th century. These are reform-minded Orthodox priests who would like to revive the church in the Russian lands in the Slavic-speaking lands, and who are convinced that what the Slavic peoples need, what the Orthodox peoples need, are, is a moral revival. They aim to curb drunkenness, smoking, long-standing leftover pagan practices. They fight against adultery and the disrespect shown by common people for liturgical practices. So it's a, fun, it's a type of fundamentalism. But it's also a fundamentalism that is tied directly to acts of charity. They're going to emphasize, the zealots are going to emphasize the principles of charity, help to the poor, alms, medical care, what we would call today social services. That said, many aspects of their social reform, many aspects of their church reform are going to suggest here as well at least a degree of xenophobia. 
The zealots are very much opposed to the encroachment of Western ways, Latin practices, which they identify effectively with heresy, with heresy. It's the zealots of piety, for example, who are going to encourage Tsar Alexei uh, to continue quarantining Westerners in that foreign settlement of Moscow. And in fact, the foreign settlement is going to be reformed and, and enhanced as a result of the influence of the zealots upon the Tsar. Now, for all of the claims among the zealots and other church reformers of the need to sort of uh, maintain tradition and maintain the history of the Russian Orthodox Church, the reality is that by really the middle of the 16th century, even uh, learned churchmen, Orthodox churchmen, had come to recognize that in the books that they possessed, the liturgical books, the, the prayer books that had been passed down to them over the course of the many, many years, there were inconsistencies. Inconsistencies between the old church Slavonic text and the original Greek text from which those works had been translated. How do you, how do you translate? What's the actual physical process by which you translate and you, and you preserve a Greek text into an old church Slavic text? Who does this work? How does it get done? By How is it done in the West? By hand. Oh, it's done by hand. Scribes. It's done by scribes, exactly. It's done by scribes. And invariably, when you've got these guys working late at night in poor lighting, their eyesight failing in these monasteries, mistakes are going to appear in the works. And mistakes had appeared in the works, multiple mistakes. None of them affecting any major issues of theology or interpretation, but some of them having to do with what we would call daily practice, daily practice. For example, whether or not it was appropriate to make the sign of the cross with two fingers, which was by the late 17th century, the Russian tradition, it really ingrained itself in the daily practice of the Orthodox, or with three fingers. Three fingers is the correct way. Okay, from the standpoint of inheriting that Greek tradition. Now, there's an argument to be made. You would use two fingers representing the duality of Christ. Right? Or three fingers, the Trinity. Okay? And it was, in fact, three fingers that was appropriate, but many, many local parishes were still were using two fingers. Other questions arose. The number of hallelujahs that were said at, any, at a particular point in the liturgy. The proper Russian spelling of Jesus and the way that you would transliterate that name from uh, the Greek into the Old Church Slavonic. The procession around the sun, does it go counterclockwise, or proces around the, sorry, procession around the altar, do you go counterclockwise or clockwise? All of these things were relatively minor <coughs> changes, but the zealots of piety are going to seize upon the subsequent attempt to undertake these corrections as signs of the influence of the West. And this is another one of the ironies. Even though they had trained under an individual who, had been, uh, who, who himself was quite learned, and they had uh, adopted the process that Mugila had, uh, had instituted, they are going to make the argument, and it's a legitimate argument from their standpoint, that the texts that are coming over that are being corrected are being printed where? They're being printed in the Latin lands. They're being printed in Bielorussia. They're being printed in Polish. They're being printed by people who've been infected with Latin and Western ideas. This is going to come to a head in the late 17th century in one of the most tragic episodes of Imperial Russian history when, as a result of the efforts of leading church hierarchs to correct and to bring into line these texts with the old Greek ways, the hierarchy aims to impose reform upon clergy at the local level who are resistant to it. The Russian Orthodox Church schism is in some ways, I suppose, like the Reformation in the West, to the extent that the printing revolution has helped engender this change, engenders a change in the West. Martin Luther is going to uh, is going to produce his 95 theses, nail it on the church door, and what he's arguing is that now that printing has made Bibles readily available, each individual in reading the translated Bible into a vernacular can come to his or her own understanding without the need for a clergy. In the Russian case, however, the situation is reversed. You don't have somebody at the grassroots level offering up the challenge. 
it is the top of the hierarchy that is trying to correct the text and impose it on the believers at the parish level. The individual who is going to lead the charge is one of the most controversial figures in Russian history, the patriarch Nikon, who is shown here um, in an anonymous portrait from sometime in the uh, mid-17th century. Nikon was an ascetic monk from the Transvolga region um, who had attracted the attention of the young and impressionable Tsar, Alexei I, or Alexis I. Alexis would meet him, would meet Nikon when he was 23 years old, and he would turn to this monk for guidance and support. And in time, so impressed was he by, by Nikon's advice that he would bring Nikon to Moscow. And he would see to it that Nikon is gradually going to be promoted up the church hierarchy until um, he is named in July of 1652 Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. This is the equivalent position of Pope in the Roman Catholic Church. He is the head of Russian Orthodoxy, charged with preserving, maintaining the spiritual and theological life of the Orthodox faithful. Nikon's personal influence over the Tsar is so great that some have argued he is effectively the real ruler of Russia from 1652 to about 1658, when we're going to find out Nikon and Alexis, having matured a bit, Alexis says, are going to have a, a parting of the ways. During this period, Nikon is, is not only exercising considerable influence over the Tsar, uh, he begins using the ecclesiastical hierarchy to augment uh, his own position. He's going to win, so he's going to secure the autonomy of monasteries in the north from the state's influence. Okay, the church is trying to become a more independent entity under, under Nikon. When Alexis is away from Moscow, Nikon is going to exercise sole political authority. Now, Alexis is early on not quite aware of what's underway. As he, as he ages and he wisens up a bit, Alexis is going to recognize that, that this church leader is a threat to his authority, his secular authority, and his legitimacy. Nikon is important for us because he is going to launch using the printing revolution that has belatedly arrived in, in Russia. He is going to use the Moscow uh, printing house, which as I mentioned last time is controlled by the church, to, get, to begin producing new religious publications aimed at combating the Catholics and the Uniates. It is in the course of printing these texts that attention is once again drawn to the mistakes that exist in those uh, uh, manuscripts preserved and recorded by the scribes. He's also going to introduce new architectural styles and push for reforms of ritual and practice. Nikon is, from a personal standpoint, intolerant, he's pushy, and he's imperious. He is in a rush to get the reform work underway. And as a result, you've heard the slogan, haste makes waste, mistakes enter into the work that's aimed at correcting the older mistakes. By 1654, however, a spate of new books are prepared, and these are going to be imposed on local parishes by the patriarchate. Uh, church uh, emissaries are sent out into the local uh, parishes, the local priests are confronted with the new books, and many of them resist. And when they resist, the church, using force when necessary, confiscates the old books, burns them, and imposes upon the priests new ones. This is not the way to engender a favorable response among the locals. It alienates many of the parish priests, so much so that the resistance to what come to be known as the Nikonian forms grows. But Nikon in 1654-1655 still has the Tsar's support, and he's going to be able to continue pushing through his programs of reform, acting in an increasingly imperious manner, so much so that he finally alienates the Tsar. And in 1658, Nikon and Alexis are going to have their personal break. In a political ploy, Nikon, believing, believing that the Tsar is still dependent upon him, Nikon confronts the Tsar, and he resigns his position as patriarch. Now, 
what he's thinking is that Sar is going to come running back. Oh, no, no, no. Please don't do that. Your holiness, uh, I, I need you here by my side. It's a major mistake by Nikon. Alexis accepts the resignation. Nikon is going to be shunted away to one of those northern monasteries. But the process of reform that Nikon has launched is still underway. And the Tsar, because he had been so close to Nikon in public and in private before, sees himself as necessarily needing to continue the reform launched by the church. In no small part, because Alexis truly believes, he recognizes that there were mistakes in those books. Ultimately, what is going to happen is that in the midst of this conflict now between the hierarchy and the local parish priests, the efforts that are being undertaken by the hierarchy are coming to alienate those locals, many of whom have come under the influence of the zealots of piety. The zealots interpret these reforms as the encroaching influence of the Latins. What they're seeing as well in Moscow, they're hearing tales of the arrival of mercenaries, of the arrival of engineers and architects and craftsmen from the West. That German settlement, the population is beginning to grow, and they see themselves, they feel threatened. Right? The traditional holy orthodox ways are being threatened by these encroaching Westerners. And they begin campaigns to stop the use of tobacco, to burn musical instruments. They're going to they're go into towns, they're going to gather up musical instruments, they're going to burn them. Orthodox liturgies are properly chanted. You don't have organs or, or any kind of musical instrumentation. It's all vocal. And they see any type of an effort to introduce instruments into uh, a religious practice as being smacks of Westernism and the heretical Latins. They want to prevent representational art. They want to preserve those old uh, iconographic forms. Uh, in, in 1649, to cite one example, they organize uh, a campaign where they gather up six carriages full of musical instruments that have been confiscated from amongst the parishes and amongst the local population. And in a public ceremony, they burn them as a sign of it, of the purifying, their effort to purify the lands of these Western influences. So the opponents of reform are going to take up increasingly extreme views in no small part because they feel that they're, be, they're being harried and persecuted by the hierarchy itself. Nikon's behavior in the run up to his uh, uh, retirement his resignation as, as a patriarch only stirs up uh, the passions of the zealots and the fundamentalists even more. Rumors begin to spread that the individuals who were translating those, those Greek texts into the supposed correct new texts, those translators weren't orthodox at all. They were Latins, they were Muslims, and in some cases, they were Jews. These things are anathema to the true religious orthodox faithful. A dark mood begins to spread among the fundamentalists, and speculative writings emerge, focusing on numerology. And attempts are found, their attempts are made to find meaning in names and dates and symbols. Some are going to argue that Nikon himself was the Antichrist, or the precursor, the forerunner to the Antichrist, as the Tsar injects himself now into this broiling debate. They interpret Nikon as being akin to John the Forerunner, or John the Baptist, for, for Westerners. Where Nikon was John the Forerunner, it is Alexis himself who is the Antichrist come to earth. Okay. Alexis has a problem. He has to resolve this roiling crisis. There is tumult not only in Moscow over this, there's tumult in the local parishes as well. So in 1666, 1667, he is going to convene a church council to resolve once and for all these issues. What the council ends up doing, what the council ends up doing is it accepts most of Nikon's reforms, but deposes Nikon formally from his church affiliation, his church position. He is banished to a northern monastery. Those who refuse, those who refuse to accept the Nikonian reforms, however, are going to be excommunicated. So the reform is going to be imposed upon the local faithful. Those who oppose the reforms are labeled schismatics, schismatics. The Russian word is raskoyniki, raskoyniki. It comes from the Russian word raskoy, which means <coughs> split, division. These are the ones 
who are creating the divisions. Those who claim, now here's the thing now, the Tsar has interjected himself into this religious dispute, into this reform dispute. If you are a member of the so-called Raskolniki, not only have you been excommunicated as effectively a heretic, you've done something else. What power is behind the reform? Other than the church. The Tsar. You are... You are committing not only heresy, you are committing treason. That is something that autocratic authority cannot broke. Those who refuse, those who refuse are going to be labeled not only heretics, but uh, conducting treason against the state, and they are going to be hunted down like dogs. So the, the, the schismatics, or as they refer to themselves, or the old believers, the old believers, Old believers are going to begin fleeing from the persecution of the state. Leading individuals are going to be rounded up uh, by czarist officials and by the church officials who are in cahoots with the state. And there are, it doesn't affect just the peasants in the countryside. There are also some members of the old Muscovite boyar class, the boyar estate, the, the leading nobles of the country, who are going to refuse to adopt these new Western ways they too are going to fall under the influence, are going to fall, I should say, or be targeted by the state uh, as heretics and as uh, those uh, who are treasonous to the state. This is a painting, 1987, uh, depicting the Boyarina Morozova. Here she is. She, uh, Morozova was uh, an old believer. She refused to give in uh, to the imposed reforms brought about by the, uh, the Nikonian efforts and by the Tsar, and she is going to be dispossessed uh, by orders of the Tsar uh, and, and dispatched into uh, Siberian exile. This painting from 1887 depicts the day in which she is being carted out of Moscow. And you can see her here, you know, some groups, women over here to the right who are weeping, others over here to the left who are laughing at her fortune. But here she is, defiant to the end, holding aloft her two fingers as a symbol that this is the true way of making the sign of the cross not that heretical, in her view, three-fingered way. And here's, a, here's an old beggar, a wandering fool, who's say, sin, you know, indicating his uh, solidarity with her. Okay. This is going to prove to be a, a major drain on uh, the, uh, the intellectual capacity uh, of, 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 of Russian society. Peasants, Cossacks, craftsmen are going to flee central Russia for the far north, Siberia, and the steppe lands, seeking nothing more than religious freedom. They will be persecuted well into the 1670s and the 1680s. In some instances, uh, fearing the approach of state uh, agents or fearing ultimately that what is transpiring are the end times prophesied in the book of Revelation. This is, for these believers, the coming of the apocalypse. Their way of life is ending. Uh, entire communities of believers in areas Siberia and the far north were gathered together in the churches that they've managed to construct, lock themselves in, and immolate the building, committing acts of mass suicide by burning themselves. I read a while back, they're still finding people. Yes, yeah, in fact, it was about a year ago or so. Um, old believer communities, because again, Eurasia, the Siberian expanse is a vast, vast territory. Soviet authorities into the 1920s and 1930s end up finding communities of old believers that had gone off in the 17th century and managed to disappear out into the, you know, out into the step, all right, to the Taiga. And there, there, was a, there was a story that emerged about a year ago, I think it was, of a family of old believers um, who had been just discovered living in basically a dirt hole uh, by a helicopter that was flying in some remote area of the Far East. So yeah, the old, there are still old believers. The old believers are going to remain a part of Russian society. The persecution begins to die down into the uh, 18th century, and some of the old believers are, are going to come out of the woodwork, but it's it's, um, they, they remain, I guess, the best, the best analogy, I guess, would be they remain closeted. Okay, in, in imperial society, there are people who are known to be old believers, um, and it's just, it's, it's frowned upon officially by the state, by the 18th and the 19th centuries. They're left alone, sort of a live and let live. In no small part, because many of these old believer communities prove to be immensely productive. 
They are going out into the taiga, they're establishing their own societies, they want religious freedom, and these communities are going to emphasize values that are otherwise difficult to find amongst Russians, namely hard work, thrift, and sobriety. <laughs> Okay. And there, some have argued that there's something akin to uh, an old believer work ethic. If you've heard of the, the Weberian Protestant work ethic, that the idea of faith makes you work hard in this life because you're glorifying God, the old believers are a reflection of this to a certain extent as well. But what is curious about this aspect of, this, is, this really is a, 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 reflects the impact of the print revolution in Russia, is the extent to which the process unfolds with a very different dynamic. These are not local parish priests rising up using print uh, to assert their independence from the church hierarchy. Instead, in the Russian context, it's the Russian church hierarchy using their monopoly of the technology to impose their will upon the locals and to impose uniformity of faith allied with the church, or allied, me, allied with the state, allied with the state. So these are some of the tensions that are roiling Russia at the end of the 17th century. And it's with that in mind, that this idea that Russia really is caught in this early modern period between East and West, the arrival of technology, the arrival of new ideas, the arrival of new military approaches, and the, the efforts of the Tsars going all the way back uh, to, to, to Ivan III in the late 15th century. Tsars have already, the state has been bringing in Western institutions, Western individuals, as a way of trying to buttress its authority, in a way of trying to modernize certain practices. But the difficulty here of balancing those innovations with traditional ways of life are creating very, very difficult tensions within the empire itself. The person who is going to step in at the end of the 18th and the first quarter of the, of the uh, I'm sorry, at the end of the 17th, and the first quarter of the 18th century to try and bring to a conclusion these tensions and forcibly drag Russia into the modern period is a fellow by the name of Peter the Great, who very much hated the old Moscow of the 17th century with its tumbled down wooden shacks, its muddy streets, its gloom and its darkness. Peter the Great is going to try and forcibly drag Russia toward the West. It is difficult to overstate the importance of Peter the Great to Russia's later historical development. He is arguably the most important ruler in Russian history. I suppose if you were going to have to make a, a list of all of the, the top ten Russian rulers, I would probably put Peter at the very top, followed by Joseph Stalin, and after him, Ivan IV. Stalin. That's next semester. I don't have time today. <laughs> no doubt Joseph Stalin, arguably the most, in, most influential person of the 20th century, bar, bar none. But it's difficult to overstate the importance of Peter to Russia's historical development. His turbulent reign is going to serve as a, as a fulcrum, a turning point in the history of the country and also the history of Europe. He would serve on the, year, on the throne for 43 years, the first seven as a minor under the regency of his half-sister Sophia. He would oversee the country's transformation from an isolated regional power into a dominant force in Northern and Eastern Europe. And it was through Peter's efforts that Russia would become a permanent fixture for the first time in European geopolitics. There were numerous consequential achievements that emerged under Peter's reign. The bureaucracy was expanded and it was rationalized along European lines, albeit, albeit in an incomplete fashion. He would significantly hasten the tempo of industrial growth, found the first large-scale enterprises in the country. Peter was also responsible for the first Russian educational, scientific, and cultural institutions as permanent entities. He would direct a revolution in culture and the arts that would see European styles and tastes inculcated permanently into the way of life, at least among the Russian upper classes. What Peter aimed to do was to instill Europe's dynamism and vitality into what he thought was a moribund and backward society. In every single instance, these reforms were undertaken in pursuit of a single goal, and that was Peter's desire to transform Russia into a world-class military power. All of Peter's reforms are motivated by his desire to augment the power of the state. He will modernize the army, 
institute new forms of conscription, and literally establish with his own hands the modern Russian Navy. The one constant, the one constant feature of Peter's reign was warfare. In the 36 years that he sat on the throne in his majority, from the time that he comes to the throne in 1689 as an independent adult male, the 36 years that followed, Russia knew one year of peace. Russian armies are constantly in the field. The Russian Navy, once it's built, is, is almost constantly uh, engaging its enemies. The earliest and principal challenge would come from the Ottoman Turks to the south. To the north, Russia's challenge would come from the Sweden of Charles XII. How are you going to go about meeting the challenge posed by these two powers? Peter's reforms are driven by the fear that if the Russian military was not modernized, if it continued to lag behind Europe, Russia itself was at risk. That was the idea of, of, of insecurity. Despite Russia's vast size, vast size is masking the internal insecurities that the country faces. Real reform, he believed, required a complete break with the past and a rapid headlong effort to stave off backwardness. He would be in a hurry, constantly. And as with those Nikonian reforms that were rushed, the rush job is going to give way to mistakes and a great deal of waste. Haste and waste. The modernization, however, Peter was convinced, required not only the adoption of Western practices, it required as well the adoption and the institutionalization of outward Western forms. Western methods, policies, institutions, and ideas would be appropriated not because Peter worshipped at the altar of the West, but because Peter was convinced that the Westerners did things better than the Russians did. And that by adopting those Western modes, those Western institutions, those Western ideas, Russia could rapidly catch up and then move ahead into first place. Peter is alleged to have said at one point to an advisor, we, must, we need Europe for a few decades, and then we must show her our rear. Peter was a giant among men. He stood six foot seven, which today makes you a small forward in the NBA, but six foot seven in 1689 made him a towering giant over his contemporaries. He was tall, he was wiry, but he possessed incredible strength. While Peter was still a young man, stories abound of his ability to bend metal coins with his fingers, to roll up silver plate with his own hands. He seemed to have a boundless energy. He was always in a hurry. He seemed to be in a constant state of agitation, restless activity. He would take on for himself tasks that normally might have been performed by several men. Very few people in his entourage, Peter, we're going to find out very early on, creates the equivalent of a posse. Peter, very early on, demonstrated his ability to outpace, to outwalk, to outmove anybody who was around him. It seemed that as Peter was making his strides at six foot seven, his courtiers and his servants were running to keep up with him. That's depicted brilliantly in this uh, Valentin Serov painting from 1907, Peter the Great, where we can see on this windy, cloudy day, Peter standing strong as the wind is bowing his servitors who are following behind as he's marching forward, forward into perhaps the future. <clears throat> he was considered handsome, despite the presence of a nervous twitch in his face, which gave him this menacing and agitated appearance from time to time. Emotionally, emotionally, the Tsar seemed always to be at the boiling point. He possessed a constant inner rage, and throughout his life he battled with it and typically lost. He was capable of feats of great magnanimity, but he was also more frequently capable of venting his anger in unspeakable acts of petty cruelty. At times, it seemed, the Tsar derived personal pleasure, personal pleasure, uh, from the suffering of his enemies. Peter was a man of excess. Excessive strength, excessive determination, excessive temper. To these excesses we must add as well the Tsar's excessive consumption of alcohol. He led a dissolute life. He had odd, bizarre tastes. Tales abound of drunken binges and parties that he would throw. Oftentimes they lasted for days. Bacchanalia. Is, is the only thing that we can call it. 
No one dared leave one of these parties. If you'd been invited to have wine and drink and to feast with the Tsar, you were there at the Tsar's order, you drank at the Tsar's pleasure, and the Tsar's pleasure was for you to drink and drink and drink. You were not allowed to leave. You were expected to continue, and he had a voracious appetite for alcohol. Those foolish in attempting to do so could be beaten and fined. As often as not, what ended up happening is courtiers and members of his entourage would pass out drunk in their own vomit and their own urine, at which point <laughs> the revelers who were still abound and could still stumble around would urinate on them some more. <laughs> treating, treating them, laughing at their expense, treating them. If you ever see, if you go on online, you see somebody in the fraternity gets drunk and they write on their face with a pen or something, with a Sharpie, same kind of thing that Peter the Great is doing only using things that are nasty. I mean, Sharpie's going to leave a mark, but you guys get the idea. We, we've got the, the tales are recorded by those who are in his entourage. A court jester would ride into the room on a horse and fire a pistol into the air every time that Tsar drained his goblet. Elsewhere, Peter would later have a cannon set up on the embankment. They would fire rounds into the air. When Peter ordered, because the revelry inside had grown to such a, a great uh, uh, crescendo. On one such occasion, a foreign observer noted, more gunpowder was used up than in storming a fortress. Like to drink. On another occasion, Peter arranged to have a beautiful midget jump out of a cake. <laughs> and in fact, he was, he was fascinated by, I guess we call them little people today. I don't know what the politically correct term is. I'm not all that interested in politically correctness. Uh, political correctness. There, there's stories abound there. This is actually taken from a lithograph of what is known as the wedding party of dwarves. At one point early in his reign, he gathered up midgets from around the empire, and he held a mass, a mass wedding ceremony at court because he delighted in little people. He thought they were just, they were amusing. Okay. Um, he had a predilection for the bizarre. This would lead to the establishment of the country's first museum, something known as the Kunstkamera, where Peter ordered from around the empire oddities collected, two-headed calves, conjoined babies. These would be preserved in large jars of alcohol for those to come and see. It's still there. Unless I'm mistaken, you can you Rasputin, we'll introduce him briefly at the end, the, the mad monk from the Transvolga, his penis is on display. He was prodigiously endowed. Now, what, how do we account for this bizarreness, this odd behavior? Peter is unlike any other Tsar Russia had ever seen. Much of it owed to his childhood experiences. There would be a succession crisis that followed the death of the individual who preceded him. He was not preceded by Alex, uh, Alexis, his father. He was preceded instead by Tsar Fyodor III, who was a bit of a tragic figure. Fyodor III was, by all accounts, an incredibly intelligent man, but he was a man who had been afflicted, historians believe, by scurvy. He was terribly disfigured, and he was bedridden for much of his reign. Uh, Fyodor would reign from 1676 to 1682, a relatively brief one, but one in which the Tsar attempted to introduce a series of enlightened reforms. Fyodor would die airless. He did not leave progeny, and this would produce, this would produce a succession crisis. And one of the things I believe I've already said, Russians do not do transitions of power well on the rule. And that would certainly be the case following the death of Fyodor III. In the midst of the succession crisis, the Strelci regiments stationed in Moscow would rise up, agitated by leading boyar families as a struggle ensued to determine who would succeed Fyodor III to the throne. Peter would witness rioting members of the Streltsy murder one of his uncles and murder, as well, one of the helpmates of his mother. Yes, ma'am? How did he get in power anyway? That's what we're talking about. That's what I'm talking about right now. Okay, oh. he's, because he is one, he is, he is, he is, one of the eldest surviving, he's the eldest surviving son of Alexis. No, I mean Alexis. Oh, Fyodor Fio III was the eldest surviving son of Alexis when he came to the throne. Oh. When Fyodor dies, the oldest surviving son is now Peter. Okay. Okay. But Peter is going to end up being, he's going to be brought to the throne as a result of the internecine power uh, politics between the leading boyar elites. 
Boyar clans are going to be competing to place their preferred heir on the throne. And what's going to emerge is a co zardom or a co-regency, with Peter ruling alongside his half-brother, Ivan V. Both of Ivan, and Ivan V was mentally incompetent. Um, uh, also, uh, a, little, a little bit uh, disfigured, he, was, he just didn't have everything up there. So Peter and Yvonne the Fifth are going to rule together, the half-brothers, both of whom are underage. They are going to rule under the regency of Yvonne the Fifth's sister, a woman by the name of Sophia. So Sophia is the regent overseeing the rule of these two underage co-zars. Yvonne's sister? Yvonne's sister. Yvonne's sister, not Peter's sister. She is Peter's half-sister. Okay. Now, what ends up happening is in Moscow, they build a throne with two chairs. One for Peter, one for Yvonne. <laughs> it's a very, very odd arrangement. All the same, Peter is, as a young man, in 1682, sovereign. And he had immense authority as sovereign to command others, but not at court. At court, he's under the control of Sophia and the boyars who are supporting her. He's given great freedom. Sophia doesn't want him around. The boyars don't want him around because they're actually controlling the situation. When he is away from the formal seat of power in the Kremlin, he uses his circumstances to do what he wants. You have a man of endless, boundless energy who's witnessed terrible things in his life, who is mistreated, although not tortured, by his half-sister. He has immense power, no one controlling him on a day-to-day -day basis. He's like the latchkey czar. Right? He's just going about doing his own thing. Is this the kind of person that's going to learn personal restraint? No, of course not. He does what he wants to do when he's away from the throne. He receives no formal education as a young boy, but he possessed an almost insatiable thirst for knowledge. In his lifetime, Peter is going to master approximately a dozen different trades. Woodworking, carpentry, shoemaking, shipbuilding amongst many. Woe be it, woe be it to those in his entourage who had a toothache. Because Peter also considered himself an accomplished dentist. And throughout his life, he would carry with him a bag containing the teeth that he had pulled from those who had claimed, well, they had a, they had a sore tooth. So you didn't want the solder knife. He'd go in there with a pair of pliers and pop it right out. Uh, he knew native Russian, though <coughs> not well. He was capable of signing his name. He could write orders. Typically, his Russian was crude and grammatically incorrect. It was sort of a contradiction. Here was this incredibly intelligent, capable man, but one who didn't have a lot of education. It's one of the contradictions. Peter is a man of endless contradictions. What education Peter did receive, he got from a most remarkable source. He got it from the foreign settlement in Moscow. Because as a young boy at the age of 12, 13, 14, trying to get away from the oppressive influence of the court and the boyars and the intrigue and the, the trauma that he had experienced as a young six-year-old watching these brutal murders, he goes off and he finds his way to the foreign settlement and there, at the age of you know, 12 and 13, those formative years, he hangs around with craftsmen from the West, Dutch shipbuilders, English engineers, sailors, soldiers, and mercenaries. What, what do you learn to do when you hang around with foreign sailors, soldiers, and mercenaries? Drink. Peter became adept at drinking and whoring. Those are the two skills that he mastered perhaps better than all the rest. But he also developed other more practical skills. He would develop a passion for all things military. He would accept early on into his entourage, into that group of individuals whom he is going to patron, or serve as patron later in life, he would, he would gather Swiss and Scottish army officers who joined this growing association of close confidants. He would sharpen his skills outside of Moscow at a suburban estate known as Priobrezhenske, where he commanded so-called toy regiments, toy regiments of men, live men in uniform with guns and artillery and horses. And he would go out and under the guidance of the Scottish and the, uh, the English tutors, uh, Scottish and Swiss tutors, he would command them on the battlefield. 
moving them and learning how to occupy battle in these toy regiments that fired live ammunition. Okay. Against whom? One another. Oh. Well, you aim high. You're not trying to kill them, but you know you don't. You're not firing blanks. You're firing live shot. And then you would you would say, okay, you know, these three guys have fallen. They're injured, and now you're going to regroup and you're going to do it again. He's he's learning on the field. He's practicing war games basically. Okay. By the time that he would assume his adult role as Tsar in 1689, two of these mock regiments, the Priobrzezhenski and the Semyonovsky, would emerge as the very first uh, elite guards units in Russia. And all the way down to the fall of the Romanov Empire in uh, March of 19, uh, February of 1917, the Priobrzezhenski and Semyonovsky, these were the two most elite regiments in all of the army. They were founded by Peter as a young boy practicing uh, outside of, of his state of Priobrzezhenski. Upon assuming the Russian throne in his adulthood in 1698, uh, Peter is going, or 1689, 1689, uh, Peter is going to use his posse, use the army troops to dispossess Sophia of her regency. She's going to be exiled uh, into a monastery. She's going to be forced to take monastic vows. He can get rid of her in that fashion. Peter is going to now assert control formally over the Russian throne. His, uh, his, uh, his uh, half-brother Ivan is going to die uh, soon thereafter. So Peter is, after 1689, effectively Tsar by himself. His aim after becoming Tsar was not to, was not to emulate the introspective and insular policies of his father uh, or to maintain that Muscovite court ritual. Instead, having been schooled in the inns and taverns of Moscow's foreign settlement, he wants to bring the spirit of Western learning, such as he's learned it, into Russia itself. His model was not Alexis. And I want to go back now for just a second. His model was not his father, who we've seen here in traditional Muscovite garb, just as we saw earlier Boris Gudunov, just as we saw earlier Ivan III, just as we saw Ivan IV. Traditional Russian kaftan, the long decorated and embroidered cloak, the little, uh, the, the cap, the fur-lined cap. Obviously, we have our double-headed eagle from Yvonne III. We've got the orb symbolizing his sovereignty. This is the way that all of our previous Tsars would have been depicted, <coughs> either in portraiture like this or in an icon, in traditional Muscovite styles and tastes. Not Peter. Peter rejects entirely this outward demonstration, and what he is going to do instead is he is going to adopt very Western uh, modes of representation, as we see here. This is a portrait that Peter is going to have done in 1698 uh, during his grand embassy, I'll talk about that in a second, when he is in England. And what Peter is interested in doing is he's interested in emulating Western monarchs. He wants to rule in Russia after the fashion of a Western uh, king or a Western emperor. Someone, for example, like Louis XIV, who was understood at the end of the 17th century to be sort of the paragon, the, the, the perfect exemplar of what it means to be an absolutist monarch in the early modern period. And here, uh, the portraiture, even though Peter's is done earlier, this is a standard conventional pose that a, that a monarch would have his or her uh, portrait done in. And here's Louis in his full plate uh, with his, his, his rod of power in the background. Uh, there's a battle raging. I forget which one it is. I apologize. Here's Peter, almost exactly the same pose in his plate of armor. Here are his royal symbols. Here in the back is a naval battle that's underway. He's holding in his hand not a rod of, of power, but a telescope indicative here of his desire to bring Western technology and science to Russia to modernize that country. Peter wants to institutionalize European-style absolutism in Russia. He wants to move away from that old Muscovite way of practice, the Muscovite way of dress, of speaking, of thinking, of acting, of institutionalizing power, and he wants to instill Western dynamism. The evidence of Peter's desire to do so would come about very soon after he assumed power in 1689. In the year 1697-1698, Peter is going to embark at 20, as a 25-year-old man uh, on a major milestone in the history of Russia. It is known as the Grand Embassy, the Grand Embassy of Peter the Great. 
It would mark the first time in Russia's long history that one of its rulers traveled outside the country to visit Europe. It would be profoundly influential in setting in motion as well a revolutionary program of technological transfer and Europeanization that would dominate Peter's reign and dominate Russia, honestly, uh, for, for many, many years afterwards. He was accompanied by a huge entourage, about 250 nobles, attendants, and support staff. And he makes his way to Europe in disguise. Now think about the silliness of that. Six foot seven, Russian speak, he speaks a little bit of Dutch too, he's picked up pigeon Dutch from the tavern. So he speaks a little bit of Dutch, he speaks some Russian, six foot seven, walking around in Europe with a, an entourage of 250 people, and he's taken to disguising himself as a carpenter. <laughs> so he's sort of play acting, he's a carpenter with 200, and the, the, the monarchs in Europe, what the is this? They don't know what quite to make of it. There have been Western visitors to Muscovy over the years, and they've written tales about the barbarism and the oddities of this oriental despotism. And here one of them is coming, and he's adopting and aping Western ways, and they're going to play along for the most part. And he's going to be received at court. He's going to travel to Austria. He's going to uh, travel uh, to the Netherlands, because he wants to see Amsterdam. He's just in love with the Dutch. He's very much impressed with the Dutch. He's going to make his way to London, and on the way, he's going to continue engaging in the sort of day-to-day -day activity that he would normally engage in, which is learning and doing and, and seeing and observing and drinking and whoring and learning and drinking some more. And when he's done drinking, drinking some more, his entourage destroys several estates. Because you know, he's going to be put up in the, in, the, in the countryside estates. The one that he's put up in in England, they absolutely trash. The place has to be effectively you know, rebuilt from the inside because of what's found, you know, what, what they leave behind after they've, uh, they've, uh, they've had their fun. So he travels for about a year and a half uh, visiting the Netherlands and England in particular because those were the two countries in the world at the time that were really the foremost leaders in shipbuilding and the maritime trades. Now, he, ostensibly, he's gone abroad because what he wants to do is he wants to learn how things are underway in the West. He also is seeking erstwhile allies in an ongoing conflict against the Ottoman Turks. But what the Grand Embassy really ends up being is an early modern form of industrial espionage. This is an espionage trip. Open, to be certain, but nevertheless espionage. Throughout his travels, Peter is going to exploit almost every single opportunity to recruit European technical experts. And he's going to call them, he's going to give them contracts and offer them money to come and work in Russia. And in relatively short order, a large number of engineers, architects, sailors, military officers, artists, engravers, craftsmen of all varieties are going to sign up to do so. By the summer of 1698, at least 800 had arrived in Moscow. A very large influx. You know what those churchmen are thinking? They're not happy about this. At the same time, at the same time, uh, he begins purchasing equipment, tools, supplies. Tons of equipment are going to be sent from Europe to Moscow as well because these craftsmen need things to work with, the latest European instruments, the latest European fashions. The European tour is going to introduce the Russian courtyard to Western manners, customs, and institutions. It gives the Tsar and his closest associates direct experience with foreign ways of doing things, and it's going to instill in Peter a passion for everything Western. This is a much later painting from the 19th <coughs> century, but it, uh, it aims to portray here Peter the Great at the Deptford Doctor. The Deptford Doctor outside of London was the world, at the time, in the late 17th century, this is, if I'm not mistaken, the world's largest shipyard, right? producing around a dozen large seagoing vessels um, I think it's per annum. Okay, it's a very high level. This is where the heart, really, of English shipbuilding is. Peter visits the Deptford Dockyards, and what does he do? He builds ships. That's what he's shown here by MacLeese. Here he is with his leg up on the stool. You can see the saw that he's just been using. And his interlocutor is William of Orange, the king. And he doesn't look quite so dynamic, does he? Almost effeminate looking down, sort of glancing at Peter. What do you make of this guy? It gives you an idea here of the interchange. Yeah, we've got a couple of midgets. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there they are. Uh, and we've got the instruments and the ships and the models that Peter is collecting. Okay, what do you make of the guy? Midgets, midgets, everywhere you go. <laughs> you weren't expecting that in Imperial Russia. Um, 
He's also going to begin collecting books. He serves apprenticeships. He, he apprentices himself as a boat ride, as a carpenter when he's in Amsterdam and London. Uh, he visits botanical gardens, observes medical procedures and scientific lectures at the Royal Society of London. He's very interested as well in medicine. At one point when they're in London, they go into a room uh, where uh, the, the, uh, the instructor is showing the medical students who've gathered how to dissect a corpse. So they're, con they're conducting a vivisection of a corpse, learning about the, the parts of human anatomy, and the, the men who are with him, the Russians who are with him in his entourage, are just appalled at what they're seeing. In part because uh, Russian Orthodox, the traditional Russian ways of thinking, where like there are, you don't do certain things with the body. You do not cremate uh, someone who's, who's dead in Orthodoxy. It, it's, it's, you, you're, you're destroying the, the vessel of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it, there, there's a real taboo against things like that. So there's a real taboo against vivisection as well. And some of the members of his, of his entourage are just disgusted and creeped out. They start to get sick of their stomach. Peter is humiliated. He's embarrassed by the way they're acting. Because here are the British medical students just observing like nothing's going on. And see, so he orders those men who've shown weakness to rip out the tendons of the corpse with their teeth. One of the other things that Peter is going to do on this visit is he collects as well as many as 2,000 separate books. Think back to what we said last time about that delayed Russian printing revolution. These are going to represent more than four times all of the books published in Russia during the entire 17th century. There aren't 2,000 titles published in 100 years in Russia. He collects 2,000, he brings them home, and they're going to form the basis, ultimately, of what becomes the Russian Academy of Sciences, which is founded in 1724 by Peter's orders, influenced by one of the greatest German mathematicians of the day, a fellow by the name of Gottfried Leibniz. So having spent the better part of a year and a half touring the continent, in the summer of 1798, word arrives to Peter that there has been an uprising in Moscow. It's the Streltsy again. That cast of shooters who've emerged as a fireman police force, they're angry, they're upset, they're not being paid, they feel that their prestige um, is, is, is lessening under the influence of these encroaching Western ways. Peter is mad as hell. He cuts short his embassy, he goes home, and by the time he arrives back in Moscow, the uprising has been dispelled. But Peter now has the opportunity of dispensing justice. He orders the ringleaders of the uprising to be hanged, their bodies to be drawn and quartered, and the parts placed on display around the city as a warning to others. Other members of the uprising are going to be dispossessed and exiled into the far north of Siberia. Another late 19th century portrait, Vasily Sorokov's very famous morning of the execution of the Stelsi. And here we can see one of them in his, in his, his red coat, his mourners around him, uh, women and children crying, and here, Peter. You can see the fury in his face as he looks down upon these men who've committed an act of treason. Okay. So Peter is going to dispense justice after his own fashion. Soon after that, Peter began instituting the range of reforms that would come to be synonymous with his reign in the process of westernization. In 1699, he ends the use of the Byzantine calendar. Ends the use of the Byzantine calendar, which had begun each new year on the 1st of September and marked the passage of time from the biblical creation of the world. The world was believed at the time to have been around 5,500 years old. Okay. He's going to adopt the Julian calendar bringing Russia into line with the West, except for the fact that a few years after, Western European states are going to switch to the Gregorian calendar. And this is one of the ironies here, but it's telling about Russia, about Peter's reform efforts. He brings Russia up to European standards only to find Russia falling, literally, behind by 13 days when the Europeans move on to adopt the other calendar. <coughs> Russia retains that older one. And that's going to be the case all the way through the Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah. The following year, edicts on dress required that townsmen and women abandon the Muscovite costumes, abandon those long caftans, abandon the long beards, and begin adopting European styles. In fact, long beards are going to be banned from anyone at the court 
Members of the court's elite are expected to sport clean shaven faces, mustaches perhaps, or you can have a beard after the Western style, like the one I'm sporting, but not one of those bushy beards of the faithful. And we have stories abound of courtiers refusing to abide by the Tsar's edict and Peter would drag them into court by their facial hair and slice it off themselves, shaving them with a razor. Or in this Lubok, this woodcut image from the 18th century showing Peter here, here's a member of the old belief, the Raskolnik, saying, uh, you know, uh, I will not allow you to shave my beard. I will basically stick it to you if you try. Uh, we know who's going to win this fight. It's going to be the Tsar. Later, sometime later, Peter is going to relent, always sensing an opportunity when, one, uh, when uh, one appeared. He is going to impose upon those who wish to keep their beard the famous beard tax. You can keep your beard, but you have to pay the state for the privilege of sporting it. This is a beard token from 1705. It says, and here you can see the nose and the mustache and the beard, and what it says in Russian, money taken. So what you would do is if you're confronted by uh, the police, if you're confronted by a noble, you're wearing your beard, you would present your token demonstrating that you had paid your tax to the state. You, were, you thus had the privilege of wearing that beard. Nobles would come to be expected to emulate European habits and etiquette. Peter would order the production of state-sponsored manuals that gave nobles instruction on how to, how to act in polite society, like etiquette manuals, how to sit at a table, how to use a knife and fork, that you don't spit on the floor, that you don't blow your nose with your fingers. Nobles are also expected to adopt popular European practices. He encouraged people to smoke, to play musical instruments. And from 1703 onward, the ancient use of Slavonic letters as a way of marking mathematical equations and things like that would be replaced with Arabic numbers. This is a, a, a clock face from the Suzdal Kremlin. And what you see here, these are the old Slavonic letters that were used prior to Peter in <coughs> place of Arabic numerals. And the one, two, three that we would recognize. A, B, G, D, it's just, it would be like A, B, C, D, that sort of thing is the way that you would count them and there was a complex way of arranging them once you got past your 10th spot. Now the imposition of these foreign practices were all bound up in Peter's broader campaign. What he's aiming to do is to transform Russia into a technically advanced nation. There is no better example of the advanced technology of the West at the end of the 17th century than Western European naval power, expressed in particular by the British, or the English, and the Dutch. It's why, it's, why England, it's why Peter goes to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam. It's why he goes to the Deptford dockyards. He is terribly, terribly impressed, and for good reason, with European shipmaking technology. These are the most complex technological systems of the day. They are the equivalent in terms of their complexity uh, to the internet today or to the airline system today. It's not simply a ship. You don't have, you don't have naval commerce because you have a ship. Okay. Armadas of vessels require an entire support infrastructure. It had arisen over decades and over centuries, dating all the way back to the 13th century and the, in, and the introduction of something known as the stern post rudder. Change and, and technological advancement is going to be driven from the late 15th, late 15th century onward in Western Europe by the outward movement of European explorers, led first of all by the Portuguese and a fellow by the name of Vasco da Gama, who in the 1460s, in search of an alternative route to the Orient, specifically to Indonesia and to what the Indonesians have that the Europeans want in the 15th century. Not just yet. Spices. There's a very lucrative spice trade from the Orient to Europe that prior to the outgoing Portuguese and later the Dutch, the spices were coming through Asia, through Central Asia, through the Ottoman Empire and into Europe. So it's the Ottomans, the Arabs that control the spice trade. They're growing rich off of this. What do the Portuguese want? They want to supplant the Arabs in controlling the spice trade. They want to make money. So Vasco da Gama is going to secure state patronage 
to send out vessels to sail around the Cape uh, of, of Africa, around the, uh, the Horn of Africa, or not the Horn of Africa, around Southern Africa, make their way to Indonesia, and along the way they're going to discover ports and they're going to begin the process of establishing trading posts on the outlying coasts of Africa, thus setting in motion the first stage of Western imperialism. The slave trade will evolve out of this, but so too will the spice trade. And the, the Dutch are going to be followed by the Spanish. The Spanish are going to sail west to the New World. They're going to subject South America. They're going to subject Mesoamerica, the conquistadors. Right? They're going to crush the ink of the Maya, the Aztecs, because they have guns and horses. Oh, yeah, and disease. That's sort of important as well. Because in the process, in the process, what the Western Europeans are going to do is trans transmit unintentionally. They don't know about these. They know, they know what the pox is. But the, the native populations there in the New World have no natural immunity to things like smallpox, and it's going to decimate uh, entire civilizations, making them the Europeans master of the New World, but giving them the resources of these areas over to the states that control uh, the, the trade and control the commerce. Russia, too, is an imperial power. It's an empire, but its empire has been built entirely across the Siberian and Eurasian land base. Okay. And because of that, Russia has not developed the technologies it needs for great ocean-going vessels like this. And with the, the, the rise of this ocean-going trade, what we see emerge over the course of the 15th and 16th centuries, growing demand for timber, hemp, pitch, bronze, sailcloth. If you have growing demand, you're stimulating the rise of these industries. New institutions to sustain and support naval exploration and commerce. Joint stock companies, investment banks, stock exchanges. These things arise in order to meet investors' need for the incredible amount of capital that is required to build one of these ships, then to outfit the expedition. There's a great deal of risk that is entailed. Is it easy sailing the Atlantic in the 16th century? No, sir, no, ma'am. These ships are shipwrecked. They can, be, they can fall prey to pirates. Um, the men can die at sea when the food rots or they lose their way. It's a very risky enterprise. So you're trying to balance the risk with some degree of oh, insurance, with the rise of insurance companies as well. Really, the makings of much of the modern world can be traced to this period, and it's a direct result of these voyages of exploration, conquest, and commerce. It's a hunger for gold, a hunger to conquer, and a hunger for spices that drive the West's outward expansion. And with it come things like contract law, civil courts, as merchants and investors are seeking to regulate these increasingly complex transactions. So the institutions that otherwise would seem to be utterly unrelated to shipbuilding are formed in the course of this early modern period in Europe. Does Russia have any of these? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. What the Russians are using still to administer their territory prior to some other reforms Peter are going to, is going to introduce are those old Muscovite prikazi, those ad hoc departments. Uh, I need someone to collect taxes. Okay, you're in charge of the Department of Taxation. I need someone to serve as the Director of Foreign Relations. Okay, you're going to be in charge of what I would call the prikaz for foreign relations. That ad hoc Muscovite way of doing things, a really a medieval way of doing things, has to be changed. So Peter's drive, I'll give you guys a chance to stretch your legs here in just a second. Peter's drive uh, to build a Russian Navy along European lines requires much more than simply building ships or importing shipbuilders. Alexis had tried to do this. Before Alexis, Mikhail Romanov, the, uh, uh, the, the first uh, Romanov czar, had tried to do this, but they didn't import the Western institutions. Peter is going to import the Western institutions. He is going to establish something known as an admiralty chancery in 1700. It's built upon the model of the Dutch uh, admiraliteit. That's the, that's the shipbuilding uh, entity. He's going to develop as well um, uh, educational establishments to produce the experts who know the things that need to be known in order to sail abroad. A school of mathematics and navigation, at first staffed by British officers, is formed in Moscow in 1701. It's later going to move north after, after Peter establishes St. Petersburg. Schools for artillery, language study, and engineering are going to follow. Now, all of these things are critical to the long-term development of Russia. These are schools. These are the first secular educational establishments. But this is, this is very important. These schools are not established for the purpose of instilling in students 
critical thinking skills. That's why you go to school. I'm going to be an independent critical thinker. These schools are established because Peter wants functionaries who can serve the state. This is a utilitarian practical education. He wants individuals who can competently serve the state. Peter's educational philosophy is neatly summed up in the original decree that established the navigation school in Moscow. Administrators were instructed, were instructed, and I quote, admit freely those who are willing to learn, compel those who are not. Students would be subjected to harsh discipline, even for minor infractions. If you were delinquent to class, you were late, tardy too often, you could be flogged. During the second year of operation, the, of the 200 students who were there on state stipend, 127 ran away. <laughs> okay. The need for surgeons, because when you're at sea, you've got to have medical care aboard those ships. The need for ship surgeons is going to lead to the rise and the strengthening of, of, of Russian medical establishments. The first fully blown Western hospital is built in Moscow and established by a Dutchman named Nicholas Bidloo. Don't, don't worry about his name. I just want you to know that, that this is part of, 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 the, of the transformation as well. Okay. It's very rough going. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of resources. Bidloo has trouble uh, bringing in and, and sustaining the supplies of medicine and whatnot. All the same, all the same. By, by 1723, the school had managed to train 73 Russian personnel. By the end of the 18th century, 800 individuals will graduate that medical school. Additional hospitals are going to be established in Kazan, Varonish, Astrakhan, Arhangelsk by 1733. Here, Peter was setting in motion a range of reforms that are going to establish Russia's position as a Europeanized nation. The Prikazi are going to be abolished. The old Boyar Duma is going to be replaced by something known as the Senate. The administrative colleges replace the Pekazi. They're modeled along Swedish lines. One more thing I have to say, and then I'm going to let you guys take a break. The other major development that Peter introduces in 1722 is uh, the imp imposition of something that is known as the Table of Ranks. The Table of Ranks. This is an actual manuscript from 1722. The Table of Ranks was designed to replace the previous Muscovite system <coughs> of promotion that was known as Mistichestva. I'm not going to ask you to remember this. I just want you to be able to see the word. This was the old practice within the Boyar clans, within the Boyar clans, of determining one's social hierarchy. Hierarchy was based upon, was based upon uh, the age of the clan. So everything is rigidly established based upon old tradition. And if you were the top member of your clan, your family, but your clan ranked below someone else's, the lowest member of that clan was entitled to sit at court at a higher rank than you were. The Muscovite boyars were very, very rigidly concerned about rank in place. This actually is abolished under Peter's predecessor, Fyodor III. Peter is now going to interject a table of ranks in 1722, and what that did, the table of ranks established three categories. Military, bureaucracy, and court. The court would be the people who actually serve at court, as opposed to bureaucracy, someone like in the center of the administrative colleges. There were 14 ranks for each type of service, Theoretically, you entered into your service. If you go into the military, you enter as a private. You work your way up the rank. Same thing that you would do in the bureaucracy. You would enter the bureaucracy at the lowest rank, and you could work your way all the way up to the top. Once you attain the eighth rank, you were entitled to hereditary nobility. Which meant that, for the first time, commoners could now earn ennoblement. Who's that going to upset? The old nobles, the old boyars, they don't like this. They don't like this at all. The other important thing about the table of ranks is although it replaces this older system, it too comes to be regarded from a social standpoint, your rank is going to be very, very important because each rank in the table of ranks gave you another privilege that outwardly indicated your exact position in the table of ranks. 
And it's going to continually evolve over the course of the 18th century. Ultimately, by the 19th century, every rank has a certain outward insignia. The color of your pants that you were allowed to wear, or the stripe or the width of the stripe going down the trouser, whether or not you could wear epaulettes on your shoulder, the color and length of your coat, so that when you saw somebody on the street, if you were a member of the state bureaucracy, you knew immediately whether or not that person was above or below you on the table of ranks. If they were above you, how did you act? You were obsequious. If they were below you, you kissed on them, figuratively speaking. Okay? Because Unless rank, you're at a party. huh? Unless you're at a party. Unless you're at a party. That's right. Unless you're at a party. Well done, sir. Well done. Okay. Finally, the, the most important thing about the table of ranks is what this does is it enshrines the practice of one's rank. One's social standing, one's privileges are directly tied to service to the state. That is what matters. Your, your level of rank in your service to the state. This is a monumental importance for subsequent developments in Russian history. Take a few, head out, stretch your legs, and then please come back. We've still got quite a bit of ground to cover, and we're running short of time.